want to welcome you to the 11.30 a.m. Wednesday Lunch and Bible Study from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Currently, we're studying the days of Noah uh, based on what Jesus taught us in Matthew 24, 37 through 39, when he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man, and we are living in the Son of Man. And so I thought it would be of great interest to us to see what were the conditions that God brought judgment on an entire civilization called the antediluvian civilization. I mean, what was, what was it from that civilization before the flood that is important to us after the flood, the post-diluvian period that you and I live in, and specifically the days of the Son of Man, which means the days between his first coming and his second coming, the days of the Son of Man. Um, I want to take a, a moment to personally thank you for uh, attending our Bible study on Wednesday through the Internet. Th that's a, a wonderful thing for us as a church, and anytime we can hear from you, it, it's wonderful for us uh, to know that you're studying with us and, and that we can be of some assistance and help to you. And so I, I, the study that I'm doing right now on Genesis 6 is prevalent and important to all churches everywhere in the world right now. Just like the COVID has affected all of us and brought us into a, a common boat, so to speak, of how we're going to get through the stormy waters. It's not vaccines. It's the, that's not the only solution to it. It's God Almighty. Where did this come from? What's the purpose of it? And we're all in the days of the Son of Man. And he said, I want you to look back at the post-Diluvian period to, to show you something about, about the, from the antediluvian to show you the post-Diluvian and especially this part called the days of the Son of Man, which is the period between the first and second coming of Christ. We call it the church age in that period. So we're going to discuss that today in the subject, Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God. Also, we want to be sure that you, you know that when we get into Genesis 6, chapters not, uh, 6, Chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, this period there is called the last days of the days of Noah. It's what's recorded. And we know he told us that was 120 years. Now, we don't know what the, we know we're in the last days because Jesus said you're in the last days. When, when I go back and, and am seated at the, at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, you're in the last days. And you'll be in the last days till I come again. That's why it's relevant, the antediluvian period, to our period. Um, and so I find this to be of, of significantly importance to us. Uh, and the last days of Noah are described as 120 years. But listen, the last day is what I want you to focus on. The last day was when Noah entered the ark and floated off. When he left the antediluvian civilization that was going to be destroyed by a flood. And so we have, we're in the last days and there's going to come a day when, when the church age is going to be over and this last days of, of the Lord it connected with the first coming is going to change. That last day when the church is raptured, we're going to go into another phase, the tribulation and then the millennium where the ark set, sets down. And so it's just kind of interesting if you'll stay in touch with us on this. Until the day that Noah entered the ark, Matthew 24, 38. Well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our morning study. Remember the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. 
It could be mental attitude types of sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins. What should I do? How do I get out of carnality and back to spirituality? The indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. We live in the church age under the new covenant. The moment you believe the gospel of Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, the Holy Spirit takes up residence within your body, and your body becomes the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And so evidence of carnality, living in the flesh to gratify the lust of the flesh, personal sin, what does a believer do? 1 John 1, 9, it says, if, if he confesses his sin, God is faithful and just to forgive him and cleanse him. Goes back to verse 7. What cleanses us from sin? Whether it be Adamic sin or personal sin, it's the blood of Christ. Verse 7, 1 John 1, 7. That takes us back to the cross where the blood of Christ is sufficient to take the unbeliever and justify him through the blood of Christ to a relationship with God that's forever. And for the believer, he comes back to the cross, not for salvation, but for sanctification. Not for justification, but for sanctification because of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so he makes confession of his sin. He's restored to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, sanctification. Now, while you're at the cross confessing your sin, he wants you to take sin seriously. Why? Because it disrupts the walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. There, there, in Galatians 5.16, walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the desires of the flesh. What are the desires of the flesh that are fulfilled? James 1, 14 and 15, personal sin. Personal sin. And so you confess that sin, you go back to the cross, and what the Lord wants you to do when you confess your sin is to, is to realize that maybe you have a pattern, that you're getting out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit, by making bad choices based on a pattern of behavior, whether it be in your mind, uh, you know, or your tongue or your overt sins, watch for patterns. And listen, you've got to break those patterns. How do I do it? I walk in the spirit. When that lust desire comes in my heart to leave the lust of the Holy Spirit, which wants to do the will of God, and the lust of the flesh that wants to do the will of man, I choose the will of God. In that inner dialogue, in that inner dialogue, shut that inner dialogue that says, gratify your flesh. Don't do it. It's a choice. You don't have to do it. You can go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit who lusts for you to come to do the will of God. That's, what, that, that's what's called... Noah walking with God. That's what's called walking with God. Walking out your life with God. Now, you've got to learn that. So let's have a word of prayer. And we're going to get in the morning study about Noah walking with God. This is really important because he's the only guy doing it. It wasn't like there were 7,000 knees that hadn't bowed to Baal. Even they had bowed. And yet this guy, all by himself, alone, were, there's no indication. It's a, there's an indication that his children and his wife were saved, but he's the only one who said, is said, walked with God. And he walked with God in the midst of a terrible, corrupt, and evil society, not just a culture, but a civilization. From top to bottom, it was evil. Yet this guy walked as the only light. And we want to see how he did that. We're going to study that and see how that would be important for our life today. Well, let's have a word of prayer so you, we can all make a confession of our sins and privacy to the Lord. Mental attitude, sins of the tongue of word. First John 1, 9, I confess my sin. And he's faithful, uh, faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. I give you a moment. 
Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by the Internet. I'm so thankful, Father, for the ministry of the Word of God to our life that gives us a sense of direction. It's one thing to have an ark. It's one thing to have a captain. It's one thing to have the water. But we have to trust God for the direction. Direct my path that I may walk it straight and narrow to the will of God. Noah was such a man who walked with God. Didn't walk the way of the world. He walked the straight and narrow path. He walked to, to satisfy the will of God and not the will of man. I pray, Father, that we would learn from that today in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to look at, at, at uh, five things. First of all, it says Noah walked in the, in the, se the, sixth, the sixth chapter. Uh, in verses 8 and 9, we're told that there's two things, and one is a foundational idea. Verse 8 is the foundational idea to verse 9. I want to read those to you. It says, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That's number one. So you got to have verse 8 before you get verse 9. Here's verse 9. These are the records of the generations of Noah... Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time, and Noah walked with God. But you see, what Noah had to find, what Noah had to find before he could walk with God was called favor in the eyes of the Lord. When you see things like God's hands and God's eyes, we call that in theology anthropomorphisms, eyes and hands and feet. It's a way to describe to you as a human with eyes and hands and feet a principle of doctrine that we could clearly understand even as an uneducated person or a small a small person. You know, one of the first things that a, ch a, a parent usually teaches his child is his hands and his feet, his arms and his legs, and his fingers and his toes. He's already sticking his toes in his mouth, you know? And so we, we, it's vocabulary. But it's when God speaks that way to us, he's speaking in a common term that all mankind could understand, eyes. Now, that's of great importance to us when it says in verse 8, Now, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It wasn't in your eyes. It was in the eyes of the Lord. He found, and it pleased the Lord. Now, one of the things about the eyes of God is that it takes you to the character of God of omnipresent. When it says, and Noah found favor with God, found favor in the eyes of the Lord, the eyes of the Lord is an illustration of something about the character of God and it's his omnipresence. Because the eyes of God can see every, per, every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, can see every person's life. Everywhere in the world at the same time. That's omnipresent. So it's kind of an interesting idea. Now, Noah found favor. The Hebrew word is C-H-E-N, chin. In the Greek language, it is of the New Testament, that same word, idea in the New Testament is going to be called grace. Chorus. Favor, when you see the word favor in the Hebrew, chin, C-H-E-N in Hebrew, 
it emphasizes the God side of grace. That's why when Noah found grace, he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace by volition, an interest in God and spiritual matters. And he came to a place where he had to believe that Jesus Christ, or a place where Christ had died for his sins, Galatians 3.8, that he died for his sins, was buried and raised from the dead as a prophetic idea. Old Testament. Galatians 3, eight will tell you that. Calls it the gospel. Abraham had to believe it. Noah had to believe it. That was how he got introduced into the favor of God. When he accepted the gospel of God, that God sent his son or would send his son to die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead. When they believed it in the Old Testament, they were saved. It's a prophetic gospel. We, we, we believe in historical gospel. Jesus Christ of Nazareth came and died on Golgotha or Calvary. It's a historical event. It's the fulfillment of what Noah believed. It's the fulfillment of it. Same gospel. One's prophetic and one's historical because it fulfilled it. Jesus said, I didn't come to end the law. I came to fulfill it. So this makes it kind of interesting when it says, and Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. is showing you the divine viewpoint, God's view of grace. And that is his privilege to bestow favor. When Noah found, discovered, God's grace system, brought favor. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That's a really important thing. And then in verse 9, it says, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time, and Noah walked with God. <clears throat> what I'm telling you is there has to be a foundational structure of grace in your life in order for you to walk with God. That's really important that you understand that. It's really important that you understand that. Noah's spiritual growth, growth in God's grace system was an essential foundational doctrine for Noah, for Noah to walk with God amidst an evil, corrupt civilization. What, when Noah says he walks, Noah walked with God, that's a grace-oriented believer that is walking under the system, God's system of grace. Noah had learned how to live faithfully regarding the six stages of God's grace, for example. I put, you can get these notes. Right now you should be taking notes. And you can get these notes later by going to our website. But six stages of grace. There's saving grace. For us, that's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. There's logistical grace. God supplies your daily needs. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You know, give, this, this, give us this day our daily bread. This is also Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse 19. It will supply all of your needs. That's a grace system. That's a grace system. We call it logistical grace. Uh, like the manna from heaven. It didn't come from a grocery store or a bakery. It came from heaven. That's logistical grace. 
And then there is growing grace, spiritual growth, 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace and knowledge. 2 Peter 3.18. And then there's suffering grace, Philippians 1.29. It was granted for your sake not only to believe the gospel, but to suffer from it, to suffer for, for the sake of Christ, the gospel. I'm just giving you one, one point to just make, make sure you understand there are six stages of grace. That is the foundational stru doctrinal structure of God's grace system. And no, listen, you can't walk with God apart from it. So I'm telling it to you. Uh, then, of course, there's dying grace. Dying grace. Philippians 1, 20, 20 through 24 would be a good passage. There's dying grace. You know, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. For me to live for, is, is Christ and to die is better. And then you have surpassing grace, the life in eternity with God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11 would be a passage. Uh, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord would be another one, 2 Corinthians 5, 6, 7, and 8. But there are six stages. of So when it says that Noah found favor, he found grace. He, he, he found the grace system, and he, and he clicked into it, and he walked that system out in his life. That's what God expects of you and I. You say, I've never heard of such a thing. I, I know I hear it all the time. You need to be part of a teaching church. This shouldn't, be, this shouldn't be anything new. I gave you all the scriptures. This is called categorical doctrinal thinking. And that's what Noah found, and that's what he structured in his life, and that's what he walked out. What did he walk out with God? <clears throat> the same is true for you and I. God wants, God desires for us to walk with him and to walk his word. What does the Bible say about something? To walk it out in our life. Grace, not law. Grace, not law. Grace. It is grace that finds favor with God. Not law. Law is designed to condemn. To show you have a need outside yourself. A grace that can provide for you redemption. As well as living the Christian life. Here's point number two. Noah reached, what it says he walked with God. Noah reached and maintained spiritual maturity by daily cycling, categorical Bible doctrine, by faith, cycle system, the faith cycle system. <laughs> ah. Now listen, the word walk is a hif pael perfect. Hif pael in Hebrew verb. It's a hif pael. That's a reflective causative. It's reflected on the subject. Noah walked. Hif pael. It doesn't matter what he has to walk through. I don't care if it's a cow pasture or fire. He's got to reflectively choose for himself. I'm going to walk it. I'm not going to go with public opinion. I'm not going to go, well, I can't do that. If God instructs me, he'll be there. He'll be with me at the beginning of that choice. I'm going to walk it. I'm going to, I'm going to do your will, not mine. He's going to walk you all the way through the cow field pasture. 
to the very end. And then he's going to say, good and faithful servant. Every time you watch anybody, Noah, he found favor, but he was blessed in his walk. And how rewarded he was at the end that he was rescued in an ark that God said build that made no sense until the flood came. It made no sense apart from the will of God. That's why you walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is a very important. All scripture, all scripture is inspired by God. I put it on the paper. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable. Notice these two sides. All scripture is, one, inspired by God, two, profitable from God. Inspired by God, profitable for God. Profitable from God to man. It's profitable. It's inspired. It's profitable from God's side to your side. And it tells you how, how it were profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Now, where's the prophet? Here's the prophet. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. All scripture is inspired and it's profitable. And God has both these sides covered. And when you participate in, you will be inspired and you will be profited. Now you want to know the passage. Okay. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. 17. Say that little word, so that. Uh, next, listen, if you was right and taking notes like you should, you ought to circle that. Because that's the profit side. Profitable, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the results, so that the results become profitable to you. That's why God, that's why God gave you the inspired scriptures to profit, t teaching, correcting, training, and all that so that you could be adequate for every task that's set before you and equipped for every good divine production. Ephesians 4.13. Until we all attain... No, see, you missed point number two. I said Noah reached and maintained spiritual maturity by daily cycling... Categorical doctrine, whatever God's will tells you, by, by the faith cycle system. See, the grace system leads you to the faith system. You got to hear the you got to hear the word of God, Romans 10, 17. First. Second, you got to believe, you got to understand and then believe what you hear. So what you hear about the word of faith becomes faith in you. Now you're ready to apply that to your life. Now you're able to walk faith out. The faith that you heard and the faith you believe is now the faith that's carrying your life forward in the plan of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Then God begins to complete what he promised you. On the hearing and believing side, you have the promise of God. On the application and completing side, you have the performance of God, Romans 4.21. You hear it, you believe it, you walk it out, and God, God fulfills what he promised. What he promised you, they see, that's, 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 that's Noah building the ark and then getting on it and floating away to safety while everybody else perishes. Now, what God wants you to do is to get hit, reach and maintain spiritual maturity. You'll never have, you, you, one of the ways you know you, you're not a spiritual mature believer is because 
One day you believe you're saved, and the next day you don't. Fear will never get you into spiritual growth momentum. Faith does. A baby believer needs the sincere milk of the Word of God, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, that he may grow in respect to salvation. Got to get that settled in your soul. You, this is, the devil can't keep jerking you around every day. I don't know if I'm saved. 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 Listen, you know you're saved by the Word of God. Not how you feel. Not what somebody else tells you. What does the Bible say? You ought to read John 10, 28, 29, and 30. You ought to read 1 John 5, 11 through 13 and get this thing settled in your soul. You can never grow in fear. You grow in faith. I, I don't know. Now listen, I, I'm, in, I'm in Ephesians 4, 13. He says, until we all attain, reach and maintain, reach and maintain, to the unity of the faith that's reaching spiritual maturity and of the knowledge of the Son of Man to a mature man that's maintaining spiritual maturity. Now that I'm a mature man, i got to maintain it. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, what you are now going to engage in is super great, super grace life. That is when your life becomes an enormous plus in the plan of God, where it influences enormously. Now, listen, you got to be careful on, on what the purpose is. Noah spent 120 years building an ark and preaching the righteousness of God in Christ. Only eight people got on the boat out of millions. So you got to be careful on what purpose God has in your life to walk it out with him in an evil, in an evil society. And listen, what spiritual maturity is all about is called to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. You want to know what that's like? Follow Jesus in Gethsemane and then to the cross. Out of the grave, spends 40 days in post-resurrection appearances and then goes back to the Father. Then you'll understand the walking out the fullness of Christ in your life. Well... Point number three, God described Noah's spiritual maturity by four doctrinal principles in, e in Ephesians 6, 8, 9. First, he said, first, the first thing he said, maybe five, first thing he said, that you've got to, you've got to get yourself, you've got to find the grace system and click into it. Saving grace, logistical grace, yada, yada, yada. You said, I never even heard of it. You have now. Now you found it. You have found favor with God. You have now found the grace system. It's up to you to click into it. Then, in verse 9, look at the Genesis 6, 9. Watch what he says. He lists three, three more. Here's what he says that come off from the foundational doctrines of the grace system, here, here are four things that, that, that come off from the grace system in your personal life in the plan of God. It says in verse 9, Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless in his time, and he walked with God. And I'm going to show you one more. This word righteous 
is not positional. He's not talking about positional righteousness. The moment you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're placed into a position in Christ. You are baptized into Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He's not talking about that. He's talking about a man who's already saved. Who has just found the grace system. The favor of God. And is now walking that out in his life. This is experiential righteousness. This is experiential righteousness. This is righteousness that he chooses to walk every day. He's not going to walk in unrighteousness. He's going to walk in righteousness. I want you to write this down in your paper because it's not going to be on your notes when you get my paper. It's not going to be there. 1 John 2.29. 1 John 2.29. If you know that he is righteous, God, you know that everyone also who practices right, righteousness has been born of him. Who practices righteousness. Living out the righteousness of God experientially is living proof that you've been born by God. It's a characteristics of, of God. Righteousness is a, characteristics of God, is a characteristic of God. And when you live right, the righteous life, you can live unrighteous or righteous. It's choice. But you choose to live the righteous life by the power of God, both by the Holy Spirit that's in you and the Word of God that's in you. You bear witness that you belong to God. Here's Romans 6.13. Represent yourself to God as those who are alive from the dead and your members, parts of your body, as instruments of righteousness to God. Don't give any part of your body to unrighteousness. Give it all to righteousness. Give it all to God. See, that's 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 10. What, don't you know that your body is the temple of God, the naos, place where God dwells? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, no man can come to the Father except through me. Boom, there he is. Because of the blood of Christ, he lives in your life. He lives in there forever. John 14, 16, 17. What do you think forever means? Live righteous for God. Here's Ephesians 6.14. Still on righteousness. Just want to show you. I'm trying to show you experiential righteousness in the Christian life. Not talking about being saved. I'm talking about being spiritually mature and living it out in your daily living in the midst of an evil culture. 6.14. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's in that passage on put on the full armor of God. In, in verse 14 of that chapter, put on the breastplate of righteousness. A piece of, an important piece of the armor, breastplate. So that you're not hit in a vulnerable place. It's a defense of, it's a defensive mechanism in the angelic conflict. The, the devil can throw his fiery arrows at you and, and, and it can't penetrate. I'm living righteous, not unrighteous. If you live unrighteous, it gets you every time. That arrow will hit you every time. And you'll fall a casualty, wounded. If you wear, the, if you wear righteousness on you, if you wear righteousness, the fiery darts will come. The fiery arrows will come. They'll go bounce off of you. It's a protective in the angelic conflict. Are you paying attention? Righteousness. This is experiential righteousness. Then he says blameless. Blameless. I put the Hebrew word on your paper. Then it says in his time. Blameless in his time. 
It is the, and it's a reference to his genealogy in his generation. Let me read nine to you. These are the records of the ge generations of genealogy of Noah. So he introduces that. Then he says, blameless in his time. What was going on in his day? Nephilims. We've already talked about that. Polluting. An attempt by Satan to pollute, to pollute the Messianic lineage of the Sethites. And so he covered both the Canaanites and the Sethites to make sure he didn't miss. That's just the way he does it, Matthew 2. I know. And why did he do it? So that his, 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 his genetic genes and his family, that his boys, because they're the only Sephites left on earth. Adam and Eve had Seth. He became the Messianic seed. Messianic seed. Their family is the only one that hasn't been polluted. That's what this means. And these were choices he made. It was choices he made. It was choices he made and his sons made under his leadership as a good parent who they would marry. Well, geez, I don't know. Let's teach it to you. Blameless. You know what blameless means? Nobody could bring a charge against him, not even God. Because he stayed under the blood of Christ. He lived under it. Not even the essence of God could. He walked with God. We talked about that. Here's one for you. Ephesians 4.1. Here's one for you. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling, which you have been called. Walk in a manner of your calling in Christ. We all have one. We've all been called in Christ. Walk worthy. Walk in a manner that's worthy of what Christ has provided you to be able to make that walk. It's called the calling. I got one more thing that's important to see in the life of Moses, what it meant to walk. Righteous, blameless, right? Walked with God. In Genesis 6.22... And in the seventh chapter, verse 5, we're told something very important. It says, Noah did all that God commanded him. 120 years. He did all, everything that God commanded him, he saluted and did. No matter how tough it was. Genesis 6, 22 and 7, 5. The word did is asa in the Hebrew, and it's a cal, imperfect. Imperfect means that he waited for instructions every day and walked those instructions from God. God told him, this is my will today, and he did it. And he did it every day that way for 120 years. Think about that. Think about that. When are you going to grow up enough to attain that mentality? And listen, you've, you've got to get into God's grace system where he favors you in the plan of God. You've got to be righteous. You've got to be blameless. You got to walk with him. You got to do what he tells you. 
by the word of God. Not my will, but thy will be done. That's how you live. That's how you live it out. That's how you walk it out. I'm going to be righteous, not unrighteous. I'm going to be blameless, not blameful. I'm going to walk with God. I don't care what. I don't care if it's cow pasture or fire. I'm going to walk with God. Shadrach, Reshach, Meshach, and Abednego did. The fiery, you know. Listen. I was telling you. Point number four. Noah was the only believer mentioned of reaching and maintaining spiritual maturity that entered the ark that way. We don't know about the sons. We're not told. We see them after they got off the boat, but we don't see them before they got on the boat. If how they got off the boat is any indication how they were when they got on the boat, Noah was, Noah was the only one that walked with God. The rest were believers. It is hard to imagine that only eight people out of millions of people of the antediluvian civilization would choose Christ in spite of 120 years of preaching the gospel of grace salvation. This guy preached 120 years, 2 Peter 2.5, and the only people converted was his three sons and their, and their wives. Maybe his wife, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm understanding that as a believer, he married a believer. And then he encouraged his sons to do the same way. And he had to be careful because the world was becoming polluted with the Nephilim. And I'm impressed that the children, the sons, we're obedient with that, even though we know when they got off the ark, they had hang-ups, old man, old, you know, worldly stuff in their soul. You know, it's amazing to me that these people come down every day, no building this big, big ship. They come down every day. To see the progress. How's the, how's the building going on? They can't figure out what it is. He said, what is that? What is that that you're building? He says, an ark. We'll talk about it later in our studies. They didn't understand that. But they were, there was a wonder. It was one of the wonders of the antediluvian world. Noah, this guy is building this huge, and he says it's going to float like, How was that great big mammoth thing going to float? Well, Noah would tell them, but they didn't have any clue about what all he was talking about. But I'm impressed with the fact that they're down there every year because 2 Peter 2.5 says, Noah, preacher of righteousness, during this period of time, preached every day. He built on the ark and preached every day. To the, when the people would come, he would stop building the ark. He would talk a little bit about the ark and then invite them to, to find Jesus Christ because he's the way you get into the ark. Because judgment is coming. A great flood of water is going to come. It's going to destroy everybody except for those who have a free pass to the ark through Christ. <laughs> he preached every day. Told them every day. Kept building the ark. Building the ark. Preaching it out. Nobody got saved. But every day he preached. Nobody got saved. Every day he preached. Nobody got saved. He preached every day. Why? Because it was the will of God. And he was walking with God. And God said, I want you to walk it out. I want you, I want you to tell him every day. Why? 2 Peter 3, 9. Because God is long-suffering and patient that none would perish. My, my, my. 120 years, nobody got saved from the community. And probably some people, when the rain came, and Noah and them got on the boat or were loading, they probably said, I didn't help build the ark, so probably I can't get on it. 
I laughed at Noah while he's building it, so I probably can't get on it. Listen, he probably stood on the ramp to the people that had come to see if the thing would actually float and invited them to Christ to go to safety. Because, God, because he had the heart of God. And God is not willing that any perish, but that all would come to salvation. Are you, are you listening to me today? You've got every excuse in the world why today you will not believe the gospel that Jesus died for your sins personally, was buried and raised from the dead to give you life everlasting, to offer you a life and, and a ministry opportunity in the world that's phenomenal, and to die and go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and to be with Him forever. And you've got every excuse in the world. Listen, it's time to put all the, bury all those excuses. Get rid of them. They're going to destroy your life. What do I have to do to be saved? Believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead the third day. When you believe it, you get saved. You're not saved by works. You're saved by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift. Get on the ark today. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. There's going to come a last day in the days of the Son of Man, and you've got to have a passage before that day comes. Believe. Still, stop listening to people who tell you, well, you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to do this, and you have to do that. Then you can get saved. And to do nothing. Christ did all the work, but you do have to believe. You got to believe it, my dear friend. You got to believe it. You got to believe it for your personal salvation. You got to believe it. If you don't believe it, you don't get it. You believe and receive. Noah's family was the only one choosing to engage in God's redemptive plan. And they were the only ones that had passage on the ark. Noah and his family were in step with God and out of step with the world. Where are you? They were in step with God and out of step with the world. Where are you? <laughs> Man, I don't have to tell you where you are. Where are you? Listen to, listen to Ezekiel 14, 14. Even though there were three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, by their own righteousness, they could only deliver themselves, declares the Lord God. Even though these three men were in the midst of by their own righteousness, they could only deliver themselves. They couldn't deliver anybody else's. Their righteousness was based in Christ, and they couldn't deliver anybody else. Their righteousness, the, my salvation doesn't benefit you if I don't tell you how to get saved. Oh, I'm saved. When I die, I'm going to be with the Lord. If he comes back, I'm going to go with the Lord. based on the Word of God. These things I have written, that you may know you have eternal life. John 20, 31. 1 John 5, 13. Well, how do you know that? I know it by the Word of God. That's how I know it. 1 Peter 3, 20 says, this is when Jesus goes to, to Sheol, in his burial, dies on a cross, is buried. And he, he goes, and one of the things he does, he meets with a thief on the cross in paradise, or Abraham's bosom, and he also visits these angelic fallen angels, these fallen angels. We've studied this, these fallen angels, who are in 
Tartarus, who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is only eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Isn't that something? How about you? I wish I could tell you that you had many days, but we don't know when God is going to shut down the church age and take the church out of it. That's Noah and the ark. But that day will come. Probably the only person that had a calendar marking them off was Noah. Had 120 years and he's just marking them off. Ain't nobody else. He preaches, you got 120 years. Then he preaches, you have 100. You got 80. You got 70. You got 60. You got 50. You got 40. You got 20 more years. You got five days. I can't tell you that. You live in the, we live in the expectancy of two things. Either you're going to die or Jesus is going to come back and take rapture. One of these two things got to happen to you. You need to get on the ark. How are you going to do that? The only way is through Christ. He's the door of the ark. Got to believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. It's called the gospel. When you believe it, you get saved. <clears throat> and you get saved by grace through faith. It's a gift, not of yourself. You got to do this stuff. You can't wait. Why are you waiting? You're waiting not to get a gift? I mean, what, what kind of... What kind of a person goes to a Christmas party that's got presents under the tree for them and say, hey, I don't want them now. I'll take them when I'm dead. Give them to me at my funeral. Is that not stupid? Why are you doing that with your soul? My, my, my. Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way. I mean, what are we doing today? We're preaching righteousness. A preacher of righteousness. How do I become right with God? You can't apart from Christ. He died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead. Father, teach him that. Put the convicting power of the Holy Spirit into the life where he convicts him of sin and judgment and righteousness. Can't be righteous by works. You can't be righteous within yourself. Christ gives it to you as a gift. Pound that, Father. Pound that idea. We're, we're in the last days of the post-Diluvian period called the church age. We're in the last days. Oh, would somebody heed my call? Would somebody, somebody in the world respond to believe? In Jesus' name, amen.